crazy what we've allowed. Mm -hmm. So I think now more than ever, the church does need to rise up. We need le leaders of faith to stand up and say, enough is enough. This is our nation. This is a nation founded under God for the protection of human life because they're endowed by their creator with these rights. And we need to remind people that this is a country that is based on Judeo-Christian values, that the reason that we're great is because we value human life. We see human beings as made in the image of God. Human beings as stamped with that beautiful mark of the Creator God. And we need to remind people of that because otherwise our nation won't succeed. For the Church Fathers, for the founders of Christianity, the first and most important purpose of marriage and sexuality was to produce children. Every single branch of the Church for 1900 years affirmed that children are a blessing and that we have no business seeking to say no to God's blessings. Yet today, we live in a culture where there is no fundamental difference on the issue of child prevention between the Church of Jesus Christ and unbelievers. There was a time when birth control was unthinkable, when contraceptives were unthinkable. Birth control is contraception or family planning. The use of mechanisms to prevent fertility or to prevent pregnancy. And what it means to many Americans is a deliverance from responsibility, a deliverance from the responsibilities of children, yet having all the pleasures of adulthood. Birth control, now more a cultural term than a medical term, was coined by Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger was a committed feminist, committed to eugenics, that is the, the slaughter of those who she perceived to be a lesser race. Margaret Sanger had succeeded in reframing the debate so that uh, opposition to birth control and abortion was seen as a Catholic thing, not Protestants. Protestants were for liberty. She understood you cannot destroy Christianity without destroying the family. You must destroy the father, you must destroy motherhood, and you must destroy babies. It has only been in the 20th century that Christians have publicly embraced the lifestyle of child prevention as biblical theology. People want convenience. People want their lives to be easy. But that's not what the Word of God bears out. Jesus wants us to give up our lives for Him. The only question is how will we give up our lives? There are a million ways in which the serpent has gotten the church to think his thoughts after them. This is one of those places where we are fed in our selfishness in viewing children as a burden. But the core of the issue remains. Is there a man-made authority to actually inject control over the processes that God has put into place? When there's a difficult issue, a hard question, go look at the history of God's people. And if you see God's people throughout the history of the church, 100% of the people took the same view, there's a pretty good chance that that's the right view. To better understand how birth control is truly a man-made concept, a historical review is in order. The history of birth control and its impact on the church, marriage, and family. It was in this time frame that the Birth Control Federation of America was renamed to Planned Parenthood Federation of America, against Sanger's objections. The new name conveyed an apparent clean and wholesome family-oriented image. I think when they hear the word Planned Parenthood, they think, oh, it's a place to go and plan for your family and, and have children, not destroy them. I think more and more people need to know that, and Planned Parenthood wouldn't want them to know that. They like to talk about all the other services they claim to provide, but I think the core of their, of their political agenda and the core of their clinic operations, 40% of their income alone comes from abortion. The way that Planned Parenthood is set up is very strategic. They focus on developing partnerships with schools and universities, relationships with young people, encouraging sexual activity and experimentation at young ages. They encourage young girls, young women to go on contrac hormonal contraceptives like the birth control pill. What happens then is more and more sexual behavior is played out among unmarried young people and contraceptives are used, but there's of course the failure rate. 
there's a lot of teen pregnancy. There's a lot of pregnancy for young single mothers in their 20s. And so what they do then is they turn to Planned Parenthood, again, who is not coincidentally the biggest abortion chain. And then they go there and are buying, purchasing 500, 800, 1200, 2000 dollars abortions to resolve the sexual activity that was started and encouraged by Planned Parenthood. In the some people say to me that if I don't regulate the number of children I have, that I'll have more than I can afford. The idea is that we're overpopulated, you're leaving a carbon footprint. What about your future? What about finishing college? What about a career? That is an Old Testament commandment given to Adam. It is irresponsible, they believe, for God to determine the number of children that a Christian couple has. Nowhere does it say in the scriptures, you know, you can't use birth control. And I say, yeah, well, nowhere in the scriptures does it say use birth control. What is the big threat about new life? What is the big threat about a child? To say, well, oh, you've got a girl and you've got a boy? Oh, that's all you need. Who said? Controlling what? We need to go back and say, does God make those arguments? What does God say? What does God praise? Do they capture the mind of God from the Word of God? Is it possible to be pro-life and pro-contraception? I think there needs to be an awakening. Just a simple awakening to say, Lord, what would you have for our womb? What would you have for our family? What would you have for our homes? 